in this morning? <laughs> well, we can uh, we can probably pray for that one. How'd it go this morning? Well, like I told Charlie, I always feel like it went well with me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I don't know how they took it, but you know, I was fine. A better question: How many people was left when you finished? <laughs> They were, they were all there. Some of them probably wanted to leave a little bit earlier, though. <laughs> you know me, I didn't. I don't know if they're used to finishing at 11:30. Like I told them, I said, uh, "Don't feel bad, guys. I got a clock." The only problem is, I very seldom ever use it. So. <laughs> He said, you know what this means? Absolutely nothing. That's exactly right. <laughs> okay, if you want, you can go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy. Uh, Brother Charlie will, bring in, will be bringing our lesson tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of going to do the introductory part, and then Brother Bo's going to bring the application in conclusion here. I'm glad everybody's here. Good, good crowd, good crowd. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead. I'll go ahead and get confession over with. Uh, you know, it probably was pretty mean of me to uh, get all this organized and then and not tell and then stick Dwayne and Charlie right at the very beginning. And I didn't share anything with them except that. Just before Dwayne had his lesson last week, he found out that he was going to be on camera. <laughs> and of course, Charlie knows he's going to be on camera. So, he's you know, you know the, but that's kind of the way I coach, too. I kind of put my players in the game when the pressure was on because I felt like I could find out how to handle the pressure and then I know whether I could use them again or not, right? So, anyway, uh, but anyway, I appreciate Dwayne last week and as we continue our study here just want to share a few things I want to read verse 3 and that's the reason I want you to open up your Bible because I want to share something that's a little bit different I want you to notice we looked at verse 1 and 2 when I did the introduction lesson and Paul does something different here that he doesn't that he does not do in his other writings he does not offer either through prayer or just through verbal expression, he does not offer a thanksgiving mm. in this letter. And that's interesting. He, he kind of leaves it out, which is his custom standard thing is praise, thank the Lord for God's grace and mercy, thank the Lord for something positive about the church. He does it, you'll notice here in this church that he does, in his introduction, none of that. And I think it's important because I think as much as anything, yes, this is a personal letter. So we need to keep this in mind as we go through this. It is a personal letter to Timothy, but it really is a reprimand through Timothy to the church there at Ephesus. And you've got to understand, Ephesus, the best way I can describe Ephesus is it was a cosmopolitan city. I would say San Francisco, New York would be good representation of Ephesus. Multiple different types of people. It was a gateway uh, through Asia Minor during that period of time. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of temples, a lot of different other types of religions there, okay? Uh, so in that respect, you know, I think, that's the reason I said I think of New York City. But he really is writing to the, for the sake of the church. Because unfortunately, as we saw in verse 3, I urge you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people and here's the key phrase, not to teach false doctrine. Not to teach false doctrine. 
And so, and that's the first thing he's going to deal with as Brother Dwayne. There again, I kind of gave him one of the harder areas to deal with yet last week. Because really, he doesn't really define clearly what this false teaching was. We do know that it, it was probably a combination. There was, there was what we call in that time Gnosticism, okay? And there was probably some flows of Gnosticistic belief going on. There was also the Judaizers, which we're more familiar with because of Galatians and certain other letters, which uh, taken, taken adding back on that you can be saved, but it'd be like us saying, well, you can be saved, but you got to get baptized first. And you can be saved, but you have to do this first. And it's kind of that's, and understand, guys, that's false. False teaching always uses Scripture. Okay, guys? Right. So, so one of the reasons we're going through this, and that's the reason I wanted to share with y'all tonight, is, is not only for y'all to understand First Timothy, but it's, I think, one of the great misjustices to the church body of Christ is that when you're sitting in a pew, whether you ever preach or teach, doesn't mean that you shouldn't know how to rightly divide the word. Amen. You should be able to sit there and understand when someone is taking liberty. I call it liberty with the text and taking it out of context and begin to use it to, and then, you know. And guess what, guys? There's stuff in Baptist life that we say, well, that's Baptist. It's false teaching, okay? It's not necessarily all we do. And that's the struggle with denominations through history if you study church history is because what? Uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church, hopefully, I'm not trying to offend anybody here, but Mariology, you know, where they worship Mary. Uh, they believe in baptismal regeneration, you know, from an infant. Someone who hasn't even confessed the Lord, okay? So in other words, and it became tradition, and of course one of the great, great misjustices of the Roman Catholic Church is that if a pope says this is true, it carries the same weight as scripture. And that's why they have their own version of the Bible, okay? So anyway, so we need to, so I want, I want you to understand that when that happens, it impacts how churches conduct themselves. That's right. Okay, it impacts, and that's why the other verse in this passage that I gave you my introduction was verse 15 of chapter 3, where he says, but if I should be delayed, in other words, because he's telling young Timothy, I might not be able to make it back. I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. So that's the crucial matter here, guys. The crucial problem, which always has to interpret the occasion for the writer, like he's showing us as he, as he goes through the Gospel of John, the occasion why John was writing, always fits into the context of what the Scripture is saying. That's how we rightly. Remember, I remember years ago, and I'll share this and I'll get ready to conclude here, but I remember years ago when I first became a Christian, I didn't have any idea. And... Uh, and we had, we had some family members that were on some other denominations. I won't mention them. I don't want to offend any denominations. But, they, but I heard this phrase from those family members quite a bit. And I accepted it as a fact uh, because I didn't know any better. Well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> well, that's your interpretation. Now, what I learned when I finally went to Columbia Bible College and learned how to rightly handle the Word of God and from being under... Uh, brother Pastor Austin in my Christian Missionary Alliance Church is that context does matter, and uh, and it's not a case of it's not a case of my interpretation or Brother Bo's interpretation. It's a it's a case of the right interpretation. Okay, and so you, so even you, so when the scriptures speak, they're speaking not only to us as pastors but to you. So, even, so when the Bible says, 
know how to rightly divide the word. That's just as much a responsibility for each of you That's right. as it That's is right. for us. That's right. Now, what we preach behind a pulpit, we will be held accountable for, no doubt. But you're also accountable for how you handle the word of God. And so as we go through here, I just want us to remember that how we perceive the Bible has a lot to do with how we do church life. And so our purpose here, as Brother Bo has shared with you, is that as we go through 1 Timothy, to encourage us to say, this is the biblical way that we should conduct. It's not an issue of whether this is Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian. It's not an issue. See, that's one of the big problems I have even with bylaws. Because bylaws get up here, <coughs> and this goes down here, and you have problems. Because this has to be up here. And when bylaws misappropriate this, then those bylaws need to go. And that's just the truth. And so anyway, I shared that with you tonight only to understand that we're these first few lessons in chapter one. Remember, it's kind of like you ladies will understand this. You're kind of setting, you're fixing Thanksgiving, you're setting the table up, right? Getting everything ready for the choice of the meal. This these first this first chapter and the first part of chapter 2 is kind of helping us set the table up for what Paul really wants to get to is how to rightly divide the word of God, how the church should function in the offices that God has given the church to function and work. So anyway, let's pray and we'll turn it over to Charles. Dear gracious Lord, we just thank you for this night. We just thank you for the privilege and opportunity to study your word. And Lord, I pray that as we continue to go through this, Lord, that you'll just guide and direct us, that you'll just help us to understand, Lord, uh, your word and how it speaks to us both individually, personally, but Lord, also how it speaks to us as a corporate body of believers who have chosen to worship together, serve you together, to love the lost world together, and to be on mission for you. Guide and direct us in everything that's said. Be with Charlie tonight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello, everyone. As uh, Pastor Skip just said, last week we learned that the church in Ephesus was plagued by teachers of false doctrine. And uh, one of the more problematic Sex out there, sex out there that were troubling the church were the Judaizers. And these Judaizers were dividing the church with their false teaching. Judaizer is one that taught that in order for a Christian to be truly right with God, he had to obey the Mosaic Law, and circumcision especially was promoted as necessary for salvation. Judaizers taught that Gentiles had to become Jewish proselytes first, and only after converting to Judaism could they become Christians, and then only if they kept the law. The doctrine of the Judaizers was a perverse mixture of grace through faith in Christ and works through the keeping of the law of Moses. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus as the elder of that city and instructed him to put a stop to the damage being done to the church by these false teachers. He charged Timothy to prevent these false teachers from spreading their false doctrine. And he told Titus the same thing regarding false teachers. You can read that in Titus chapter 3, verse 10. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, and he is self-condemned. I like the way the King James puts it, an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Oh, that sounds sinister, doesn't it? <laughs> a heretic. You hear that word heretic and you, you think of some demon-possessed weenie out there running around creating havoc everywhere. At least that's, you know, what I would think if you hear the word heretic, and that's terrible. But um, the thing is, is heretics are more common than you might think. See, a heretic is one who practices heresy. And Merriam-Webster defines heresy 
as an opinion, doctrine, or practice contrary to the truth or to generally accepted beliefs or standards. Well, isn't that deep? That means a heretic is someone who won't listen to sound teaching. They want to do things their own way. That being the case, we can conclude that the church always has been and continues to be filled with heretics. I'm sure y'all have known a heretic or two. Might even be one lurking nearby. <laughs> anyway, back to Timothy. Paul told Timothy that his problem with the Judaizers, their teaching, was not so much with the law itself. He said that the law was good, provided that it was used lawfully. That in the way God intended, for example, the law served an important purpose for Israel as a component of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. It defined and secured the nation of Israel as God intended. As for the New Testament believer, it pointed to Jesus and explained the mission of the Messiah. But when these Judaizers twisted or misapplied the purposes of the law, they departed from a lawful use of the law. Paul explained that the key function of the law was to expose sin, to define and expose unrighteousness, and to convince man of his need for a savior. Righteousness and unrighteousness are not terms that describe behavior so much as nature. Righteousness is the absence of sin, while unrighteousness is the absence of perfection. Man is wholly unrighteous by nature. And this remains true whether or not he is currently engaged in sin at the moment. <coughs> Even while asleep, a man is unrighteous. When man sins, he is acting out of his unrighteous nature. You've probably heard this before. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. <coughs> Sinful man can therefore benefit from living under law. Because that law, with that law, he can come to see how he lives in unrighteous ways. The law then is a measuring rod of unrighteousness. His unrighteousness was always there, but the law exposed it and helped him to recognize it. Paul applied this truth to the Judaizers, to these other false teachers. He said, these men in the church who desire to be teachers of the law, he said that the law was meant for those who practice lawlessness. He said, oh, you like the law so much? You want to be under the law? Let me tell you who the law is for. And then Paul listed a number of particularly heinous sins, stating that the law was for people who did such things. In effect, Paul was saying that if these men wanted to be associated with the law, let that association be in the way God intended. Specifically, let the law reveal the truth about these men's hearts. They were lawless and rebellious men. Though they desired to show themselves superior to others, by their supposed expertise in the law and their piety in keeping it, Paul said, let the law show they are no better than other ungodly sinners. They are like the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Paul threw these false teachers in with the worst of the lawbreakers. Notice that Paul ended his list of worst sinners with, quote, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. With that statement, Paul equated the work of these false teachers with the other terrible sins he mentioned. So do we really need any further proof of how Paul viewed false teaching in the church? He put it in a list with murderers and homosexuals and kidnappers and the like. And this, perverse, and this perspective was not Paul's alone. Peter, Jude, and Jesus himself also criticized false teachers in equally harsh terms. And there's a lesson there for us. We live in a society with no bedrock moral convictions. We're told that it really doesn't matter what we believe as long as we're sincere. <laughs> Young people today believe in nothing but will riot over anything. And while the modern church has also softened its criticism of teaching that is contrary to Scripture... Scripture itself roundly condemns it. Any teaching that is contrary to sound doctrine, particularly regarding salvation, is an expression of unrighteousness equal to the other sins on Paul's list. 
what was at risk here in Ephesus was the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul preached. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only truth, the only message in the universe that has the power to bring sinners to eternal life. So how dangerous is teaching that undermines the gospel message? Could there be anything more damaging to the church? Paul's instruction to Timothy was to put a stop to this false teaching. Paul also had another very important purpose in writing to Timothy. From the tone of Paul's letter, it seems as though for some reason that Timothy was reluctant to remain in Ephesus. We don't know why. Could have been that Timothy was overwhelmed at the thought of shepherding that many churches in Ephesus and training up elders to lead these churches. Perhaps he doubted his ability to do this. It may have been that he was dreading the inevitable confrontation with these false teachers. Or maybe Timothy just missed being at Paul's side. Whatever the reason, Paul had to encourage Timothy to stay put and focus on the work at hand. He did this several times, which you will see as we finish chapter 1. And tonight we'll pick up this narrative in verse 12. So start with me in verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, pointing me to his service. Though I formerly, or though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And we'll stop there for a moment. Paul had his own history of false teaching and unrighteous behavior. He did some of the things we see in his list. Paul was a murderer. Paul was a blasphemer. He was an enemy of Christ. He consented at the stoning of Stephen and held the coats of those who threw the stones. He violently, violently persecuted Christians and compelled them to blaspheme. Imagine a jihadi going about terrorizing and imprisoning and murdering Christians because they refused to renounce Jesus. Paul did that. Until one day, Jesus intervened. Paul had papers from the high priest. You could think arrest warrants. He had papers from the high priest to imprison those who believed in Jesus, and he was on his way to Damascus to do just that when Jesus knocked him to the ground and blinded him. Now, y'all have heard of having a come-to-Jesus moment. Paul had a profound one, <laughs> and it changed his life. Y'all know the story. So Paul had his own sinful history that included blasphemy and false teaching. And this history was used against them by these false teachers in their own defense against the charges he was levying at them. And it seems that Paul ran into these false teachers wherever he went. We read about it in epistle after epistle. They'd show up, start teaching their false doctrine, and attack Paul's credibility. Same thing was happening here in Ephesus. So Paul preempted their accusations in verse 12 through 16 that we just read. Paul acknowledged that, yes, he too once taught wrongly against the very gospel that he came to cherish. He admitted that he was formerly a blasphemer, speaking against Jesus. And he was a persecutor of the church and a violent aggressor. Besides Stephen, we have no way of knowing how many Christians Paul ordered to death. Paul had to deal with this inconvenient truth throughout his entire ministry. And yet, ironically, it was his most powerful defense. In fact, his testimony itself became one of the chief instruments of his ministry. Paul's history validated the earnestness of his confession. He gave up everything he valued to join the side he once persecuted. There was no earthly explanation for Paul's about face, except that the message that he now preached was true. There was no other explanation for why he did what he did. Paul's past, as, mentioned, as already mentioned, was frequently used as a tool of his critics to discredit him. After all, how can you trust the man who persecuted the very people he now claims to want to help? So Paul was forced time and again to explain how the Lord could use one such as he 
to be a rightful teacher of the gospel. Here in his letter to Timothy, Paul is once again honest and humble about his past. He admitted his crimes. There's no sense in denying them. Nevertheless, the Lord forgave Paul and showed him mercy. In offering his defense, Paul said that it was the Lord who enabled him and put him into the ministry because he counted Paul faithful. Faithfulness made Paul ready to be used by God. We often see our Christian service as a matter of volunteering, do we not? Yet as Christians, with regard to Jesus and his church, we shouldn't see ourselves as volunteers. We should see ourselves as bond servants. That's right. Amen. We are duty-bound servants of Jesus. And faithfulness is expected of such servants. You don't have to be smart to be faithful. You don't have to be talented or gifted. Case of point. Amen. Each of us can and should be faithful in the place God has put us. Some people want to be faithful or uh, want to wait to be faithful for a more opportune time. Don't do that. God wants you to be faithful right now, right where you're at. That's right. So Paul's past did not qualify, disqualify him from serving God. God's mercy and grace were enough to cover his past and enable him to serve God. So we should never feel that our past makes us unable to be used by God. With these words, Paul gave Timothy a really good reason to remain in Ephesus. He had already given Timothy the purpose in remaining, to train up elders and to put down the false teaching. Now Paul was encouraging Timothy. Again, it may be that one reason Timothy wanted to leave Ephesus and his ministry there was because he felt unworthy or incapable of completing the work. But Paul assured Timothy, telling him, if there's anyone unworthy or should be disqualified, it's me. Yet God found a way to use me, and he will use you also as you remain in Ephesus. At the end of verse 13 and into verse 14, Paul states that he was rescued by grace, though he was a great sinner. So on the question of Paul's guilt, he fully acknowledged his past. But then so must have his critics acknowledged that Paul had been made righteous by faith, just like any other believer in Christ, just like everyone else. Paul was a sinner in need of God's grace. Paul was saved like all people, by grace through faith, Christ Jesus. No special dispensation for Paul. He was just like everyone else. But then Paul moved on toward a larger question. And that is, why did the Lord appoint someone who formerly persecuted the church to such a position of authority in the church? As an apostle, Paul was a senior elder in the church. He regularly trained up subordinate elders, or pastors, the term is synonymous, wherever he went so that the churches he planted would be left in capable pastoral hands. Timothy and Titus were trained to be elders by Paul, and Paul instructed them to train up more elders for the purpose of shepherding the church. Clearly we see here that healthy disciples, to include elders, reproduce. Okay. So why would God trust such authority and influence to a man who had done the things Paul did? Paul's answer, that he acted in ignorance and unbelief. Now he was not suggesting that his sins were forgiven because he was ignorant. His sins were forgiven because of his faith in Jesus Christ. That's right. yeah. But he was saying that his opportunity to assume high office was not jeopardized by his past crimes because those crimes were committed in ignorance prior to his faith. Mm -hmm. Paul's role as a persecutor and blasphemer predated his knowledge of Jesus in faith. And therefore he couldn't have been expected to be any different. Paul blasphemed against Christ and he persecuted the church out of unbelief. Therefore, those past actions didn't disqualify him from serving God. How could any of us serve God if our resistance to God prior to faith were grounds for disqualification? Seriously, how could any of us ever serve God if our qualification for service was measured by how good we were before we got saved? How ridiculous. We're evaluated by who we are and what we do following our conversion to Christ. That's right. Paul was inferring something here about the men he opposed in Ephesus, these false teachers. And this is a critical point. 
These false teachers could not rest on the same excuse for their false teaching because they had heard the gospel and were therefore not ignorant as Paul was. Yet they continued to teach in error. So it's ironic that Paul's critics accused him of having disqualified himself by what he did prior to faith as they disqualified themselves after coming to faith. In verse 16, Paul explained why the Lord could chose someone like him to serve the church. He said it was so that God could use him as an example to other believers. Paul referred to himself as the worst of sinners or the foremost. Paul was not claiming to have committed more sins than everyone else or to have committed more especially wicked sins than everyone else. The word in Greek means the most prominent, as in a person standing in line so that you can't see who else is standing behind them. Paul likened himself to the foremost or the most prominent sinner in the church because of his past. Imagine, say, if Adolf Hitler had gotten saved during World War II. Right? He would have been saved by grace through faith. Correct? He would have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus. He would have received mercy. He would have been justified and restored. He would have been part of the body of Christ, same as you or I. Their past, or his past, would have been forgotten in heaven and no longer to be held against them. But all the while, his previous sins and crimes would be remembered on earth and would hang over his head in the minds of the people probably for the rest of his life. So in that sense, he would be viewed as the most prominent sinner in the church, just as Paul was in his day. Not because he continued to sin, but on account of his history prior to salvation. Paul said he was shown mercy as the most prominent sinner so that he could serve as Christ's billboard, as it were. The contrast of Paul's life prior to and after salvation forevermore gives witness to how patient and forgiving the Lord is uh, for those who believe in him. If anyone thought themselves too evil, too far from God to receive forgiveness, Paul stood as God's counter-argument. No one is out of reach. No sin is unforgivable in Christ Jesus. Though Paul's critics pointed to his past as evidence that he could not be trusted because he had too much baggage, Paul said his past was evidence of the depths of God's mercy in Christ. And in verse 17, Paul ended his defense with the minor doxology born out of personal gratitude, he wrote, to the king of the ages of mortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. It seems that Paul couldn't think of how bad he had once been and how great the love of God is without spontaneously bust, bursting into praise. And this outburst of praise showed that Paul both knew God and loved God. He knew God to be king eternal, ruling and reigning in complete power and glory. He knew God to be immortal, existing before anything else existed and being the creator of all things. He knew God to be invisible, not completely knowable by us mere mortals. We can't completely figure God out or even come close to knowing all of his ways. He knew God alone is almighty, that he is God and we are not. So whatever you may think of your plans and insights, whether they be wise or not, you know what? Only God really knows and understands all things. So knowing all this about God, Paul couldn't stop praising him. So here's another lesson for us tonight. If you have trouble worshiping God, maybe it's because you don't know him very well. Paul's moment of worship was recorded, written down in the letter from Timothy benefit from as well. This description of God no doubt gave Timothy still another reason to remain in Ephesus. He could and should stay there when he considered the greatness of the God whom he served. This great God was worthy of Timothy's sacrifice and could empower him in his service in Ephesus. Now let's finish with verses 18 to 20. This charge I entrust to you Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. 
By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. After condemning false teaching and defending his own position in the church, Paul instructed Timothy to fight the good fight with faith and a good conscience. Faith and a good conscience are indispensable in spiritual warfare. That's right. Without both, the Christian is powerless. The Greek word used here for charge is parangalia. It's a military word referring to an order from a commanding officer. And I love this. Although Paul issued commands to Timothy, at the same time he called him my child. But don't you somehow think that this verse just really doesn't adequately capture the degree of fatherly love Paul had in his heart for Timothy? Paul reminded Timothy to consider what the Holy Spirit had given him through prophecy so that he would be encouraged to remain engaged in spiritual battle as he pastored the churches in Ephesus. Paul elaborated on this prophecy later in his letter to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 14. He wrote, Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. We don't know what this prophetic word was that was given to Timothy when the council of elders laid their hands on him. But whatever this word of prophecy was, Paul wanted Timothy to draw strength from it. Reflecting on what the Holy Spirit had said to him would help Timothy stay strong in the difficulty he was facing. Paul had given Timothy a difficult assignment. Putting down a culture of rampant false doctrine is no small task. It wasn't going to be easy or comfortable. Timothy could not afford to be cavalier about his work. He had to approach the job Paul left him to do in Ephesus as a soldier preparing for battle. And like a soldier in battle, Timothy could not desert his post. As already stated, essential for winning a battle for the Lord are faith and a good conscience. These protect, the, these, these protect against spiritual attacks of doubt and condemnation. Timothy would need to have faith that God was all-powerful and in control and that he would guide him as he labored to correct the problems in the churches at Ephesus. Also, he would need faith and a good conscience because his enemies would be attacking him just as they attacked Paul. And if he didn't conduct himself appropriately, they would have good reason to attack him and to undermine his ministry. That's right. A good conscience isn't just a conscience that agrees with us, but one that commends us because we've been doing what's <coughs> right. It is contingent upon godly conduct. I'll say that again. A good conscience is contingent upon godly conduct. Paul went on to tell Timothy that some had rejected these weapons of spiritual warfare, faith and a good conscience. Specifically, he mentioned Hymenaeus and Alexander, two men that we don't know could have been elders in the church. Paul disciplined them for their disobedience to God either in heresy or in conduct or maybe both. Paul said they blasphemed. Mm -hmm. These men rejected their conscience and their own faith, Paul said, and as a result, they suffered a shipwrecked faith. Paul was left with no other choice but to hand them over to Satan. And Paul didn't explain what he meant when he said that he gave these guys over to Satan, but from other New Testament passages, we can surmise that he did this by putting them outside the church into the world, which is the devil's domain. In disciplining Hymenaeus and Alexander, Paul demonstrated that he was not afraid to tackle the opponents of truth, as he said to do in Romans chapter 16. In chapter 16, verse 17 of Romans, it says, Now I urge you, brothers, watch out for those who cause dissensions and obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have learned. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting with smooth talk and flattering words. So Timothy now had yet one more reason to remain in Ephesus. He should do it because not everyone else does. Paul could not depend on Hymenaeus and Alexander, but he could depend on Timothy. And here's another lesson for us. 
Not every Christian stays faithful to the gospel and does what God wants them to do. The fact that some do not remain faithful to the end should only motivate us not to give up. That's right. That's right. right? Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. It's a tough act to follow. Well done, Mr. Charlie. Uh, before I, I've got a couple of thoughts, but before I share them, you know, we talked a week or so ago about Q&A, uh, that sometimes when you're diving rather deep, uh, there might be questions that pop up. So uh, before I speak some more, does anybody have any questions? Uh, we're on, well, we finished chapter one tonight. Uh, next week we're going to pick up in chapter two. Uh, so it's kind of a good break point. If you don't have anything or maybe you're hesitant to share a question or maybe you would love to ask a question but you weren't prepared for me to give you the opportunity, remember there's no cards on the tables. I've got some up front. You can take one or two or four home with you. If you want to write some questions out, you can bring them next week or at some point we would love to answer any questions that anybody is having about anything that we've been looking at. This is tonight, going once, going twice, sold. Okay. Uh, that was fast. <laughs> yes. That was too fast. It's too fast? Okay, oh, yeah. going once. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, here's here's something that... you going to write one? If you think of one, feel free to stop me. I get to talk all the time, so I won't be uh, bothered if you have a question to come up. But here's something that... Uh, I think is just really, first of all, I love to hear Paul. I just love Paul's heart. And here's something I wrote down in my notes as Charlie was speaking, that, that your testimony, if it is a true gospel testimony, and you know how to share it, then that is sound teaching. And if your testimony is not in line with the gospel, then it could be not sound teaching. It could be false teaching. That's why we want to engage in this both individually but also collectively as a church because we want to make sure that as a church we're reading and understanding and teaching the Bible the way God intends for it to mean and be taught, but also individually, you have to then understand and transfer that to yourself, right? Because we see just in this section how God is using Paul's testimony to encourage and influence Timothy. Timothy was worried. These false teachers were trying to attack Paul. And, and Paul doesn't defend himself. He gives a true gospel testimony, which is, I was, you are right, the most wicked of wicked people, but Jesus saved me. So now what you got? I mean, because they can't say anything else past that, right? I mean, you might could argue against Paul, but I'd love to hear you stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against Jesus and let me know how that goes, Right? And so just want to encourage you to, to really think about your testimony as an opportunity for you to teach and teach well. We're going to look this summer at doing some, some training uh, on the gospel, right? What is the good news? What are the full components? And we're really hoping to transfer that into the individual. Like I can share with you, I've had to write out my testimony uh, several times, and the more and more that I do it, not only the better does it get, but it also changes, right? Not in the sense of who I was before Christ and what Christ did for me and now what, but there are components of my testimony that are different. I'm wiser now. I can think back like, oh man, I was really a bad person before Jesus, right? And then also, the more and more I do it, like, I might share uh, my testimony with Patrick, and that might sound somewhat different because I may try and connect with him in different points <laughs> of my life and what God did for me differently than I may share with Mr. Ken. And the only way that I can really do that as an individual, if I'm really comfortable with my testimony, 
if I'm really comfortable with how the gospel influences my testimony, right? What I was before Jesus, what had to happen for me to be able to stand underneath what Jesus did and be counted righteous. And then now what does it look like? So I leave you with that challenge to know because, you know, God calls out and sets apart and there are higher requirements and standards and all of those of us who have been called to teach will give an account for how we teach publicly. That's right. Right? But each individual person, each one of you is going to have to give an account for how you live your life after Jesus Christ. And so uh, an effective testimony is sound teaching. Second point that I wanted to uh, just kind of highlight, you know, we spoke a couple weeks ago about discipleship. And Charlie brought out wonderfully uh, just Paul's vantage point towards Timothy, right? We read him uh, referring to him as his son and as his child, but Paul's put Timothy in a really tough place. Like, Timothy might have been like, thanks, Dad. Appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, like, couldn't you get, so why didn't you send me to Crete? Titus' letter was like this. You had to write me twice, right? <laughs> Ephesus was real bad. But here's the thing that I love about looking at Paul and his interaction with Timothy. Is that there is mutual benefit on both sides of that relationship. Paul receives benefit investing his life into this person. He writes to him, you read 2 Timothy, and you can just read how much Paul loves Timothy and how much what Timothy is doing for Jesus is an encouragement to Paul who's about to be executed. So there's mutual benefit for Paul, but there's also benefit, obviously, for Timothy because he's taught, he's coached, he's prayed for, he's encouraged, he's challenged. Like, Timothy, don't you dare show back up here before doing what I left you to do. You know I left you to do it, and so I'm challenging you to keep doing it. Now, I don't know about you, but I need somebody to do that for me. Like, I need somebody to say, no, no, you, you need to keep going. Just because you're tired doesn't mean you need to stop. Remember what you've believed, and so keep going. And so what I talked about a couple of weeks ago is a continued challenge now. So who's your Timothy? Who are, who are you intentionally uh, pouring your life out over? Who are you challenging? Who are you coaching? Who are you praying for? And then who is your Paul in the faith? And how are you looking to that coach and saying, hey, coach me up. Don't let me be anything less than what Jesus wants for me. Did you see how Paul reminded Timothy of what was prophesied about him? He wasn't talking about like what I see in you. He was saying, Timothy, remember what God has called you to do. You're there in Ephesus to do a difficult work, and I got it. I hear you, but that's what God's called you to do. And so don't run away. Keep going. I'm praying for you. You've got this. Have at it. Right? So wonderful, wonderful picture of discipleship. And then the last thing I want to point out, uh, in Paul's testimony... And I love how Charlie brought this out and, and hammered it home. And I just wrote in big letters, you know, the previous sins don't disqualify. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, that's, that's about as gospel as it gets. That, that we are all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. And it's only through Jesus Christ that we are saved and, and faith on Him. Right? And that applies for all of us as Christians, right? And and I've got two minutes. Verse 16. He's talking, wait. Yeah, verse 16. Yep. He talks about extraordinary patience that, that God displayed for Paul. And then if you go back up to verse 12, he talks about appointing him to the ministry, even though... I was formerly a blasphemer, 
a persecutor, and an arrogant man. An arrogant man. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. As an overseer of God's household, he must not be blameless, not arrogant. Not arrogant, right? So, so what we see is that in God's plan, he chooses who is to go where. And he works one of the most wonderful stories of redemption by taking a man who was unqualified, and he qualified him. And then, like Charlie pointed out, what kept him qualified was the conduct after he believed in Jesus, after he believed in the gospel. So if he ever drifted away from the gospel, then that's when he starts to become disqualified. Okay, And that's both for the believer, that's for the deacon, that's for the pastor, because in the same way, we have to hold ourselves in conduct now the way that God has called us to. And if we preach or follow anything different, then it's going against what the Bible says. Because the Bible says that none of us are disqualified based off of what we did. We're only qualified by our faith in Jesus. I want to close. You know, we've spent time in prayer together as a, as a part of our Sunday night service. And I think it's kind of cool. First Timothy chapter 2, what we're going to look at next week, uh, talks about instructions on prayer. And I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. It's really hard as a teacher, by the way, to like hear other people teaching and like kind of got to sit back. It's like being a sports fan and seeing the people on TV doing it but not getting to do it. And so it is very awesome to see guys up here teaching and they're doing a wonderful job and it is exciting to hear God's word taught properly. So I don't want to take anybody's thunder next week, chapter 2, but chapter 2 verse 1 says, first of all then, Okay, so he's stepping out of chapter 1. Remember, he's talking about how to conduct yourselves in God's household in the church. And he says, first of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. 